I hope you guys are enjoying as much as we are doing it. And to benefit most out of this um, program, we would like your active participation. Professor Khanna would uh, has some ideas and suggestions she will share with you. But uh, you know, when you're spending time on it, you should also make it effective and efficient. We talk about efficiency all the time, but uh, what you learn from the program should also be an efficient outcome. So we are looking forward to it. There has been oversubscription to this program. Nearly 60 students have subscribed. And I'm grateful Gyan has allowed us to do it, because the whole idea is that as many students should benefit for those who are interested in learning. So uh, and uh, certificates from Gyan depend on two things. One, of course, registration at JNU Gyan, which all of you have done. They have also asked me to submit daily uh, like participation. So please sign the sheet that gets circulated. Uh, attendance sheet because Gyan has asked me and their giving away of certificates will depend upon active participation from the student for the program. That's one of the things. So I think I'll hand over to Madhu and we okay. can begin the day. Okay, thanks. Good morning. Good to see you back here again. Um, so what um, we would like to do, the uh, you know, I think what would be useful from your perspective would be to uh, think a little bit more actively about research questions, how to ta how to set up a research problem, and you know, apply economics to address answer it. Uh, and you know, and and then what? Think about what methods could be done, and so on. And some of that actually requires you to stop listening to me and letting your own mind and and you know your own thinking develop. Because um, while you're thinking to me, your brain is kind of in a different mode than when it is not listening to me and kind of you know coming up with its own thinking on its own. So um, uh, so. Yeah, and, and of course, I could talk endlessly. I mean, what I'm trying to do is uh, give you some examples of the types of problems that we can address as economists using these sort of tools and, um, and, and you know, how you might do it. But uh, maybe at this point, you know, I think what I would like you to think about is what are some of the environmental issues you are interested in? You know, it doesn't have to be anything. You don't even have to think about something, you know, too complicated or, you know, there's something nobody else has thought of or whatever. Just whatever, what environmental issue you see as being important and from your perspective. It could be things that you observe every day. You know, air pollution is the most obvious one, and that would be a good starting point. But anything else that comes to your mind is something that you see is, is important. And uh, think a little bit about what is your perspective on what is causing that problem? Why does that problem occur? Is it, you know, is it individual behavior? Is, it, is individual behavior aggravated by other institutional things, by government policies, or just the markets the way they are or whatever it is is it you know, poverty you know there are various reasons why we have environmental problems what do you think is causing it and begin to just jot that down and and it, again there's no right or wrong in this and so um don't have to hesitate at all and it's just sort of a starting point and um and then you know the next thing would be to think about okay you know, where, what can economics, how can we use economics to address this issue? Is, you know, it, does it come down to incentives? People behave the way they do because they don't have the right incentives to do otherwise. They don't have the incentives to do otherwise. They do it obviously for purely privately optimal reason. Everybody's pretty rational. What are those incentives? How can we change those incentives? Maybe just begin to think like that. So, um, and, and, you know, we worry about whether we have the data to do it and what methods we would use and stuff like that later. Right? So this is one approach to, you know, there's several ways that people come up with uh, research questions. And one of those is that you observe a real problem and real world problem and then you figure out a way, why does it exist and what can I do about it, you know, using economics. And that's ba it's basically in some ways been the approach that I've followed. I, and 
but there, that's that's one of the approaches. You could actually many other people uh, do things differently. Another way to say how to uh, you know come up with a research question is you can look at the literature and you can read papers and when you're reading papers you might realize oh this is missing in this paper and um, you know what if I changed it and then you know would the answer change so you can start from that as well or you can do something in between the two you know there are various ways you can come up with ideas um, and for the purposes of our discussion, that's perfect. Either, whichever way works for you is fine. If you've been reading stuff and say, okay, this, you know, uh, was, they, they made this assumption that was not correct, and what if we relax that assumption? Um, so, you know, or they did this in the context of a developed country. What if happens in a developing country where you have a very different situation? Any of those approaches are perfectly fine. But I would like you to begin to think about those and share them with us and share them with the class just so that we get some discussion going and hopefully we'll learn a little bit more that way than if I just sat here and lectured till the cows came home. So, um, so in the afternoon, we would like to do that. Um, we could either, um, you know, and so here's where you tell me what would be most effective. Um, you, we could either, you know, take like half an hour or so and you can uh, break out into small groups of three or four students if, you know, if you like. And within those groups, maybe as a group you could come up with, okay, let's quickly brainstorm about what is an interesting problem and you know uh, and then what are what's causing it what what are some of the solutions where can economics play a role in it what kind of research would be needed you know and then you can get into what sort of data would we need so start from that angle rather than okay here is the data that i have what question can i answer with it because that's really not that interesting always it's better to start with what is a problem you want to address and then how do you find the data to address it so we could do that um, and then come back and then we can even extend our time today beyond you know two to half an hour more or something and then have each of you uh, talk about what you have found and then we you know everybody can say okay well, what more can be added to it you know is this a good problem so there'll be all, all kinds of ideas will come out of that so that's one approach to doing it the other is we could uh, if you already have some thinking we could do it individually and you can talk about you know at least raise the problem that would be of interest to you and we could do this individually um, so I don't know tell me what would be what would you like to do say it again speak a little say it louder please individually, individually? okay, okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, would it help to have like half an hour? You know, uh, what is it like one o'clock? Say one to one thirty. We find a place. Uh, where yeah, it's fine if you want to do it individually or if you know a couple of you two or three or four if you already have a working you know relationship with each other you can uh, you know jump into it more quickly whichever way we can find a space and and take half an hour for everybody to kind of group themselves and um, just you know come up with some ideas and then we regroup as a group uh, in this room here and then you know, have each person take about five, seven minutes or whatever it takes to present it. And then, you know, let's discuss it and see what ideas come out of it and where you could go with it. Yeah? Sounds like fun. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, what about, uh, you know, so we've been covering stuff really rapidly over the last three days or so. Uh, is there are there things there that you would like to hear more of? Was there, you know, like stuff we were doing yesterday? We, uh, I sort of stopped in the middle of it. Uh, and in some ways, I mean, of course, those papers are available. I've given you the slides, and you can look at those and, you know, always go more in-depth into it. Um, 
so I'm not sure if, if it would be helpful to go back and revisit some of those in more depth if you have questions about it or, um, you know, if I, sh I mean, we can talk about new stuff. What would you like to hear? Uh, the stuff that I presented on the first day. Oh, the. Um, it depends. I think. Um, you know, it's, so what makes a paper, um, you know, publishable is that the basic test for whether a paper is you know, publishable is that, is this sort of contributing some new knowledge? You know, that's the ultimate goal of you know, publications. And so, um, and beyond that, really, y you can find a journal that will publish, um, you'll find a journal that will be uh, there to publish any particular type of method that you might be using, you know. so. Even if you're doing like cost-benefit analysis with uh, which does not necessarily, you know, like the kind that we've been talking about, everything is publishable. It's just a question of where, and um, and the onus of trying to show that why it it should be publishable is upon the writer. Um, so if you can say that, you know, um, here is a contribution that this is making, why this is new and of interest to others then that's fine. Um, so, um, so you know, almost everything that I'm actually showing you is based on published papers with the idea that it gives you an idea of what is publishable. Um, you know, as economists, we don't often do um, just spreadsheet-based analysis or like case studies, but there are journals that will publish that. It's just that we tend to go more for not doing that only, uh, and we don't do case studies because we try to be more generalizable and stuff like that. But honestly, I think quite a bit of work is good that's just in the form of case studies because that is really tells you in depth what's actually going on. So, yeah, so that's what I would say that, um, you know, especially when you're applying it to, um, uh, to a new area, like, I know you do stuff, for example, on um, you know, uh, lay, l you know, like let's say residue collection. You know the costs and benefits of residue collection, uh, and that's something that could be done nicely on a spreadsheet. And I have published papers that are that are really spreadsheet based, and some of those papers get more citations than some of my, honestly, gets more citations than what I spent seven years of my life with my dissertation research, because. Um, those numbers are important to some people, you know. So you can do what what we covered in that spreadsheet. If you apply it to an interesting thing that nobody has really done, where there is a gap, then um, you know we did this paper looking at uh, you know costs and benefits of sugarcane ethanol and corn ethanol, Brazil versus U.S. It was published in um, Energy Policy. Gets more citations than. Some of the papers that have used complicated, you know, optimization methods and stuff like that. Um, so you just have to figure out, you know, where is there a, a little chink and there's a gap and nobody knows that and people are interested in that answer. And a spreadsheet-based NPV calculation will get published. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, the other thing that I, I gave you was just a, a very simple um, exercise that, that um, you know, and maybe we can come back in, in the afternoon and talk about it. Maybe it's too simple and, you know, you can do it in, in five minutes and that may be, you know, a good sign. I mean, that it would be a great sign. Uh, but maybe it'll make you think a little bit and um, at least get you to put your pen and pencil to figuring out, you know, what is consumer surplus, what is producer surplus. But it's one thing to see it being done, on the, and when you actually do it, I know it gets really confusing, and that's when you really figure out what the differences are. So, um, so I'll, I'll, you know, 
give you take a little bit of time at the maybe at the end or during the little break that we have or something to take five minutes to see if you can fill it out and um, and then we can discuss that as well in the afternoon in case you have questions about it um, but you know so t right now I thought that maybe what we can talk about is a uh, sort of a slightly different type of problem environmental problem that we don't necessarily think about and see as much um, for a variety of reasons and maybe it's because we don't think about agriculture too much in uh, typical economics departments and and environmental problems you tend to focus a lot more on you know pollution from industry and stuff like that but um, agriculture is really a major source of pollution and um, it's one of the most challenging way challenging problems it's even more challenging than trying to control industrial pollution so I thought that here I'd, I'd talk a little bit about it it's actually becoming you know gaining a lot of importance it's even though agriculture is not you know obviously shrinking in size in all countries and people are moving into other more um, you know um, in obviously industrial and developed um, uh, sectors but um, it's actually gaining a lot more importance now in trying to think about you know this uh, uh, how do we deal with this problem of the fact that we have to increase food production we ha you know and uh, that it's all connected and you know yesterday I gave you this thing about how we have to decide how to use land between food and fuel production and and how do we use our resources between all various needs that we have and that's where it becomes really important to think about agriculture as part of the part of the things that we have to deal with do and deal with okay so I think this is good from that perspective to hear about and maybe it might spark off some thinking on your part and you know um, and and so yeah all right so what I thought today we'll talk about this problem of non-point pollution um, from agriculture we can look at how to understand some of the incentives and this is a problem not just you know developed countries and developing countries sort of both equally uh, how do we analyze these some voluntary incentives to you know adopt these eff efficiency enhancing technologies why they're a solution to non-point pollution um, how do we analyze the effectiveness of different types of policies to deal with uh, that would induce um, you know uh, adoption of these types of technology uh, more adoption of these technologies and then we'll talk about have this open discussion at the end in the second hour on uh, issues related to India and what might be some of the causes and the and the problems oh, and solutions so the reason that you know agriculture is actually gaining a lot in importance in and you'll see if you look at search is there's a lot of concern about you know that we've got to feed nine billion people the population is going to grow to nine billion people by mid-century by 2050 and um, and so you need need to produce more food and it's not just producing any old food that we are used to uh, as incomes are increasing people are uh, switching more from plant-based food to meat-based food Producing meat-based food is a whole different uh, ball game in terms of land requirements and and uh, its and its environmental consequences. Um, and on the uh, so that's on one hand, and on the other hand, people are also demanding more, uh, you know, safer food and and nutritious food and organically produced food and locally produced food and and uh, you know things like that. And um, it, so you know even like here in India you can sort of see now the variety of different types of things that are available that were not available 20 years ago in terms of the types of food and and uh, the range of products that are available and that's only going to grow so so there is this you know all of that has to come from land and um, you know land is obviously limited in supply there's just one planet and so um, so the question is how do we get more from the land that we have 
And, um, you know, we're also growing, and so we want more urban, um, need for urban development. Um, and then people want to have environmental. They, they don't want, you know, you want to have trees and open space and parks and rivers. And, you know, you just don't want to be in a concrete jungle that is just... Uh, uh, so you want, and that requires land as well. So you need, you know, you need land for food, you need land because countries want to produce biofuels. Uh, you need land uh, for uh, environmental amenities and, uh, and also, of course, for a growing population to live on. And so you need urban areas as well. So it's, it's becoming, an, uh, you know, and uh, land is one of the things. The other one is water. You know, water is an equally scarce resource. And, and so the question is, how do we use our water and, f and land to, to meet our needs for food and fuel and, and uh, environmental amenities uh, in a way that um, is optimal. Okay. So, um, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, and we clearly cannot expand production very much, so we have to use our existing land more efficiently. So how do you get more out of the same land? And obviously the answer would be we can increase yields. Um, the challenge that is this looming threat of climate change, which is going to make it harder, you know, to even maintain yields, leave alone, increase them unless we have some major improvements in crop varieties and how, you know, and, and so on. So, um, so uh, you know, and, and the current way that we tend to increase yields is by basically applying more inputs. So if you can put more fertilizer, your yields could go up. If you can switch from dry land farming to irrigated farming, your yields could go up. So, um, so, so all of that means that you're going to, you know, you're going to be adding to environmental problems when you try to increase yields. And that's clearly not, not desirable because we want to reduce pollution and we want to be able to increase yields and increase productivity in a sustainable way, right? So, um, so you, you know, and, and the other thing is that there is, um, even with the current technologies and the current varieties there are, there's a big difference in yields across countries. So it's not that, you know, every country is already at its maximum potential for how it's using land. So there's, so there's a lot of scope for improving productivity and improving the dissemination of existing technologies among, across countries to increase um, yields. So how do we achieve that? Um, we've got GMOs, which is these, you know, genetically modified organisms, crops, which have the potential to be, um, you know, to fight pests and diseases and that have all these traits that would be very desirable from, um, you know, production perspective and consumption perspective. You can get mushrooms that will never turn brown and you can get tomatoes that will be much more, you know, longer shelf life and you can get, you know, but countries have a lot of concerns about whether or not these are safe and, and for the human uh, consumption and the environment and lots of countries ban GMOs. Um, and, you know, um, uh, which there's actually very little research to support that you should ban those. But nevertheless, for various reasons, they are. And that limits our ability to actually get more from the same land and with less environmental impacts. But, you know, there is a technology, but there's also this public perception that matters and acceptability of technologies becomes important. Um, there, There's a growing... Um, you know, development of a new type of technology. I mean, it's not even that new now, but it's kind of res resurfaced, and that's this whole area of precision agriculture. And I don't know, has anybody heard of precision agriculture? Okay. So, um, yeah, so, you know, precision agriculture, we can talk, we'll talk about that. But, um, you know, agriculture is, is rapidly becoming um, very, very technologically advanced, particularly not in, in, you know, of course, in the developed countries, but even in developing countries. I mean, in India, too, every farmer has a cell phone. And with that cell phone, they can check on, you know, what are the, what's the weather going to be? What is the price of grain in the world market? When should they sell? their their uh, crop things like that and um, and and there are other ways that that you can use precision agriculture to um, to improve your the way that you're farming so you know we will kind of discuss that as well 
So, um, you know, so, so there are already technologies that exist and are emerging that would allow us to increase our productivity without necessarily harming the, the imp and having a negative impact on the environment. And then you get into the question of, well, why aren't more people doing that? And how do you get them to do it? And that's where the economic arguments come into it. Um, and then in the particular context of India, you you know have to deal with the issue that you have lots of small farms. They're not the large industrial type of farms like in the U.S. where the average size of a farm is like 800 acres. Here you will have farms that will be like one acre or two acres. And so there's a whole different type of solution that is needed for small farms than for large farms. Um, and you know, so when you translate things that might be ha be good in the Western world, you have to think about how they apply in in the in India and what might be some local solutions that would be effective. Um, so you know, and then lack of credit, lack of capital that comes with small scale farming and so on is something that needs to be looked into. Okay. So this just shows the gap that exists, and this is from a paper that looked at, at gaps in uh, yield across different places, and many of these, I don't know if you can see this from that distance, but um, many of these are locations in India. And so this says that, you know, this is 100 percent. If this is sort of the, nobody's quite at the 100 percent yield level that is currently achievable with the current technology. Um, but you can see that some of these places are, and you know, these are by different crops. So this is wheat, rice, uh, this is also rice, maize, wheat and rice. Um, and so here is uh, a lot of places in India, um, you know, uh, northern India, this is even in Punjab, it's only 50 percent of what the potential is. Um, Bihar is right here. So you've got, you know, country uh, regions in India which are, well, there's a lot of variability within the country, leave alone across countries. Uh, you know, same thing over here. You know, here is Bangladesh for rice, and here is India for rice, and here is Nepal, and so on. So, of course, one can get into how they calculated the, the how they got the data, and, you know, what to make of it. But the point is that there is a lot of there's a significant yield gap. So we're not even at, not even all places are not even producing crops most efficiently, using the best available varieties. And quite often it is because of not having the best seeds, not having the best management practices, and there's so much more to planting and growing crops than, you know, uh, it's not a very straightforward technology. So people have looked at what you could do if you were to, um, you know, uh, to close the yield gap and how uh, just by, um, you know, if you were to just uh, increase the yields for the most ineffective farmers to 95 percent of the best yields, basically this study says that you could produce 50 to 60 percent more food, okay? So, uh, you know, we need to double our food, consum food production by 2050 and you could kind of get halfway there just by taking the existing technology and applying it more. And so the question is, why aren't we doing it? You know, if it's if some countries can do it and some regions in the country can do it, why can't we do it everywhere? So, um, so that's on the production side. There's, you know, even if we don't worry about the environmental side, there is p plenty of room to improve the productivity of of our uh, production of our system. And and the difference is a lot of heterogeneity in how we are we are producing food. Um, but then there is the environmental side of things to worry about. And on the environmental side, you know, agriculture causes a lot of environmental problems. Um, it's one, it's a major source of runoff, you know, fertilizers that are used, uh, chemicals that are being applied to deal with pesticide, pests and, and diseases and, and weeds and things like that often cause a lot of environmental damage because they don't stay where they are applied and they don't get taken up by the plant, but they actually run off. The rain falls and they they run with the rain and run with the soil and they reach the lakes and rivers and then they pollute those lakes and rivers. And you can see the signs of that pollution all around you. Even in an urban area, you can see the signs of, it's urban you know, pollution here, but even if you, uh, you know, if you take a train journey through India and you look out of the window, 
you'll see so much of pollution and and stuff you know so um so a lot of that is coming because of the way that farming is being done this is you know nitrogen runs off and contaminates surface water nitrogen leaches into the ground and contaminates groundwater and and increases the nitrate levels and and stuff which make the drinking water very polluted and it's a huge human health hazard uh pesticides uh, you know is over application of pesticides to deal with crop damage and that not only causes environmental you know kind of pollution but it also increases insect resistance and so you know which means that you now need more and more powerful pesticides and those start to become hazardous for human health and so you know there are lots of them are carcinogenic and they cause a lot of pollution problem you know health issues and so it's a big big uh, issue uh bee populations the world over honey bee populations is, are declining terribly they are at you know at great risk and endangered because of pesticides you know apple orchards and if you go to the himachal pradesh and you go to kullu and all those places you'll see that the apple orchards are applying such high levels of pesticides because people want red perfectly formed apples and for that you have to keep the pests away but those pesticide applications destroy bee populations so you know and bees are really needed to for pollination services and apart from the honey but they also need it for pollination so you, if you don't have pollination you don't get good yields and so it's a circular problem and uh, but the orchard owners don't want to deal with that they so it's you know that's something that has that's another issue to think about um over tillage when we till the soil every time you, the farmer tills the soil and turns it over a lot of the the soil organic matter the soil carbon that has been that goes into the soil with the roots and the, when the plant is growing gets turned over and is exposed to the air and it gets you know it's released back into the atmosphere a lot of the nitrogen which is in the soil is becomes is denitrified and goes up as nitrous oxides and nitrous oxides and other pollutants so uh so tillage of the land causes uh environmental you know it also dries up the soil so you have a lot of soil erosion problems and sediment runoff and when the top soil runs off then the fertility goes with it so the land becomes more and more um unfertile uh, unfertile fertile over time so it's you know problems like that which um there are solutions for you can actually you know there are various ways that you can till the soil and the conventional way of tilling is actually really harmful because it involves taking away all the residue and um leaving the soil bare for for you know at least in the US you know in the winter months the soil is bare and um uh, and and you lose a lot of the nutrients and the and uh, um, organic matter and then um uh, and, and you know so it, as an alternative to that it's actually better to leave a 30% or so of the residue in the soil and kind of or to grow cover crops or to do very gentle tilling you where you don't kind of take the tractor and run it over the field and turn the whole soil up and down but you do very targeted and and you know it's called conservation tillage or no tillage there are various ways to do that that would reduce the amount of this problem um irrigation so a lot around uh, areas around the world need irrigation because they're too dry and uh, you cannot grow a crop without having irrigation but irrigation means you're going to be taking the surface water or ground water and applying that in the field and uh, there are various ways to do irrigation as well i mean the standard way to do irrigation would be you take you divert the water from the river you form a channel and then you use gravity to distribute the water in the field and you over flood the field so that you can uh, you know distribute you can get the water everywhere and especially like you know rice cultivation in the in india and elsewhere is like heavily dependent on water and it's all you know this flood irrigation which means that only a little bit of that water is taken up by the plant and the rest of the water is going to run away and go into the water bodies and carry with it the chemicals and nutrients and everything else and cause pollution 
So, uh, so irrigation is another major source of not only does it deplete groundwater because people are taking more and more water out before it can recharge, but it also is causing drainage problems and agriculture, you know, salinity, uh, uh, all the pollutants from the application of chemicals is getting into, into the water and that goes into the fresh water and the rivers and causes problems there. Um, the more cultivation we do, we are, um, you know, as we are expanding crop production uh, and we are basically, remo re you know, getting rid of natural habitats, we are causing uh, loss of biodiversity because species don't have protected areas where they can exist. And, you know, you build roads and you farm it and you get rid of their natural habitat, then, then they get destroyed. Um, uh, carbon emissions, uh, you know, on the one hand, agriculture has a potential to uh, to reduce carbon emissions because it can sequester carbon. It, you know, photosynthesis, it, trees take up carbon, plants take up carbon from the atmosphere. So it's a way to reduce carbon emissions and mitigate climate change. But agriculture also uses carbon-based inputs. So, you know, fuel for the tractors, Fertilizers are all uh, chemically based and carbon intensive. Um, um, you know, um, manure and uh, the biggest source of emissions from from agriculture are livestock production. Livestock is a huge source of methane emissions, and methane is like 21 times more. Uh, you know, has greater global warming potential than carbon dioxide. So methane emissions in the short run are worse, many times worse than even carbon emissions. And livestock is a major source of methane emissions and the, you know, the manure and all the, the waste matter is uh, a huge challenge of what to do with it. It's much more than you can you know, spread out on fields and, and use as fertilizer. So if you can collect all that and convert it into biogas and do good things with it, then it's useful, but otherwise it's a, it's a major problem. So there's all of these sources of agricultural pollution that, um, you know, are worth getting into and, you know, and I, you know, particularly worth to look at what's really been done in, in the Indian context and what are the op opportunities to do more research in these areas and, and uh, see what are the op ways to deal with the problem. Okay. So why does agriculture, why do we have so much pollution from agriculture? And um, so one of the uh, things about agricultural systems is that they are very, very heterogeneous. You know, there is, uh, it, there isn't, it's not like industry where, industry is obviously heterogeneous too, um, but you know, in, in the case of industry, you have a much more of a controlled environment. You know, you have a certain equipment, you can see how it works, and you can control it a little bit more than in the case of agriculture, because in the agri agriculture is based on a natural system. It's based on land, which differs a lot from one place to another. It's based on climate, which differs a lot even over small regions. Um, and so, uh, and you know, in the case of uh, crops, it's it's not you know the uh, the quality of the soil matters, the slope of the land matters, um, you know um, how far the land is located from a water body matters because uh, all of that determines how much when you apply a particular input, how much will remain and at that place and be available for a plant to take and how much is going to run off. If you have a very sloping field, it'll all run off. If you have sandy soil, all the water you may apply is going to go straight down. Um, if you are located right next to a river body, then uh, your everything that you apply is going to end up in the water much faster than if you're very far away from it. Um, you know, your local climate may be where is obviously very, very important in determining what, how much the plant can take up and what is the pollution that's generated. So there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity in agriculture. And uh, the question is how to deal with it. You know, should we ignore it and just, you know, treat every field exactly the same and apply the standard recommended amount of nitrogen by, or should we try to tailor the application based on what the plant needs? And, uh, and if you want to tailor it, obviously the answer will be let's tailor it, let's give the plant what it needs. 
then the question is, how do we do it? Do we have the technology? Do we even have the knowledge of figuring out exactly what the plant needs? You know, we've been doing agricultural research for over a century, and um, but you know, our understanding of exactly what the plant needs and what's available in the ground and what we should add to that to that is surprisingly very very limited. So, um, so, so the challenge is how do you, how, you know, should you um, uh, use your land wisely it requires knowing what, you know, how to, what inputs to put, where to put them, when to put them, and uh, understanding what the needs of the plant are. Um, and so what typically happens is that when you apply inputs, you put fertilizers or you put uh, irrigation, only a small percentage of it actually is taken up by the plant. In the case of fertilizers, even in the U.S., only half of what is applied is taken up by the plant. Half of the fertilizer is running off. You know, in the case of irrigation, only about 60% of the water that is being applied is taken up by the plant. 40% of the water is running off. So you're wasting a lot of inputs and not using them effectively, which means that firstly it's a cost because you're paying for all of that, so it's clearly not profitable to do that. Um, and the second is it's causing an environmental problem. So is there a way that we can actually increase the amount of those inputs that are used by the plant and then we would save money and we would also save the environment? Um, and so, uh, you know, and so that would be one solution. Um, so figuring out what is the, um, you know, how to make sure that the plants take up more requires knowing what the plant needs. And, um, and, it, and because, uh, you know, what plants need, the same plant and the same variety, what it needs differs across locations. So you have to uh, then apply not at a uniform rate through the whole field, uh, but you have to do a varying rate. You have to know, well, in this part of the field, they need, you know, it needs more fertilizer because the soil is very bad and that part of the field it needs less and 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 then being able to do that okay so um, uh, currently what is typically done is that farmers follow a uniform application rate you know they this crop needs so much uh, fertilizer per hectare so we will go and apply that and so in some places it's too little and in other places, it's too much. And so, you know, both places plants are going to suffer or either the environment will suffer or the plant will suffer. And that, you know, is not going to be very um, useful. So, so there's over application, there's under application. And it's not so much that people don't know, uh, you know, that this is happening, but it's a big part of the challenge is that it's not easy to know exactly what is it. You, you have to do soil testing. So you need to know what exactly is in the ground, how much nitrogen is already there in the ground, and how much extra is needed. It required, and, and um, the thing about these inputs is that nitrogen doesn't stay there. You know, you may test it today, and three months later, it's changed. Nitrogen moved through the soil, and, and um, nutrients move through the soil. So it's it's a dynamic problem of figuring out, you know, what's in the soil, when the plant needs it, and also knowing what the plant needs, when and how, and all of that. So it's an agronomic issue. It's not just an economic incentives issue. It's the agronomists do not know themselves how to really tell you what, tell the farmer what to do better than what, you know, they're the ones that came up with these uniform application rates, and nobody's been able to figure out a better way to do it. So. So that's how it's been done. Um, livestock production, as I mentioned, you know, a huge, huge issue of how to do it, how to contain livestock waste, and what is the best way to, to manage that uh, and, um, uh, and, you know, um, prevent it. Uh, the food that people are eating is clearly contributing also to the problem because, uh, you know, in the U.S., for example, uh, we are, they're like, uh, more than half or more of the land that we have is really used to grow corn and soybeans. And corn and soybeans are not eaten directly by people. They are used to be, they're used to feed uh, cattle and then people eat beef. And so uh, that's a really inefficient way to use the land because you know, you, uh, when you look at the corn stalks, 
every, it's, uh, acres and acres of land and a huge plant and you get like two cobs out of it and you know and then that is being used to feed animals and so there's a whole efficiency loss over there if you were to grow plants on that thing that you could directly eat you would need only like 20 percent or 30 percent of the land to get the calories that you need for the calories that you need from the land when you do it through this indirect way, you first produce a plan, then you feed the animals, then you you know eat the animal, you lose every time you do that. And so the you know on every acre of land, you can only feed like two people instead of feeding two hundred. That's the difference. Um, but more and more diets are becoming meat based, especially um, you know even in developing countries, as incomes grow, people want more, you know the demand for protein is increasing. and um, and so that's a major problem, uh, really, but not a problem that is easy to address. You cannot tell people what to eat. No government can say, you know, we're going we're gonna to ban this or that. It's very difficult to do that. And so it's, um, you know, how do you get more people to be vegetarians is, is an issue. And it's being discussed, and it's, in, you know, um, uh, it, it's definitely part of the discussion of, you know, big part of the global warming problem could go away if we became more vegetarian, if we had more vegetarians, yeah. Um, and then the last issue that is increasingly gaining importance uh, is food waste. So in, in developing countries, uh, almost a third of the, uh, uh, of the crop is wasted, uh, you know, uh, after it's harvested. Between bef after it's harvested and before it gets to market, one third of the crop in in like India and places is wasted because it's not stored properly. So you know farmers harvest it, they store it uh, because you don't have good good uh, you know locations to store it in a way that is going to prevent environmental damages, and that crop gets wasted. It's eaten up by, you know, rats and this and that, and it decays. And before it can be sold, it's it's lost. So this uh, this whole idea of post-harvest loss in developing countries is is really becoming really important. And and that's something, you know, again, it's a problem that is worth investigating. And uh, not enough work has been done on it. Um, in the developed countries, it's the opposite problem. It, the problem there is that the harvesting and, and getting ha crops to market is very efficient, and you have elevators, and things are stored, and you know temperature control and humidity control systems, and everything is all great that way. But um, about 30 to 40 percent is of the food is sold after it's been prepared. So consumers are you know after the food is prepared there is wastage of food by consumers. You throw the food in the restaurants and uh, you know you buy extra stuff and you throw it at home and you, in the dormitories and the hostels and the messes, I don't know how it is over here, and it, it could be a really interesting thing to look at what happens in, in uh, over here, I'm not sure, but I'd be interested in, that might be something we could talk about in the afternoon because that, that's it's, it's an issue. You know, when you have food being served in messes and dining halls, um, you have a tendency to, uh, uh, you know, and you've paid for it. So so it's like, you know, you're paying a fixed amount of money to be in the dining hall and, and your tendency is to overtake the food. And, um, you know, you may not like it, you may not eat it, and then it goes into the garbage can. Uh, you know, there's over preparation of food if you don't manage exactly what the demand is going to be, and then that is all thrown. Uh, at least over there. And so that's a huge challenge of figuring out what to do with post-consumer waste, you know, that the consumer is is throwing away. And again, you're wasting your own money too, but people, you know, as food is becoming cheaper and cheaper relative to incomes, people care less about it and uh, and throw it. And, and so, and it's also a generational thing, you know, the older generations, I mean, even now, you know, will be very careful about and you know a lot of us grew up with the thing that you never waste food because it's so scarce and so valuable and all of that but for the newer generation younger generations it's it's less uh, you know um, they they have less of a maybe a sense of that okay so this this shows how um, the you know areas where um, 
you have a lot of places where you could use fertili less fertilizer and get the same yield. And you know, this is a study that was uh, published in 2011 in the Scientific American. Look at India. A lot of places here where, you know, same thing here in the U.S., in the Midwest, where corn is being produced. There's over-application of fertilizer, which you could easily reduce and not lose yield, okay? Uh, so, so you could reduce the, the problem of pollution. But the problem with um, knowing what to do with this, how to deal with this pollution problem is really complicated. And in part, beca it's because of this. So think of this as a body of land, and here is a river. And you've got all these, these are the farms, and each one of them is using fertilizer, and then the you know, rain falls, or they do the irrigation, and that it starts to flow. And it's going to flow over the land and ultimately end up here in this river. And um, it's, once it's over here, or even at any point over here, you can't observe it. You can't observe pollution flowing and you cannot uh, go to the farmer and say, look, you're generating a lot of pollution here and all of that is going to come here because it's <coughs> so hard to know who generated the pollution. How much of that pollution ended up over here? It's going to go through this process. And, um, and so how do you hold the farmer uh, responsible for dealing with the problem because you cannot observe it? Okay, so this is the problem of non-point pollution. This is different from the problem of point pollution where you can observe what is coming out of the smokestack of a factory because you can measure it. You can put a monitor there, you can put a sensor there and, and measure it, and then you can tell the factory that you're out of compliance. Or even the water pollution coming out of the pipe of a factory, there's a pipe, and you can measure and you can put a monitor over there. In the case of agriculture, you cannot do that because of this, the, the way agriculture pollution is being generated. And so when you tell the farmer, he's going to shrug and sh tell you that, uh, how do you know I did it? I, was, I just applied very little fertilizer, and you can't even monitor what they did because they can do whatever they want, and who's going to, you know, it's too costly to go and look at what every farmer is doing and, you know, stuff like that. So, so non-point pollution for that reason becomes very complicated to deal with. And, and it's one of the problems that even, I mean, that developed, con developed countries are struggling with. There are lots of low-cost opportunities for agriculture to reduce pollution. Simple changes in tillage practices, simple 10% re reduction in fertilizer will not even affect the yield, but, um, you know, and would affect pollution. But um, you cannot you know, enforce it, you cannot regulate it, and, uh, you, you know, because you cannot observe and measure it, it's uh, part of the problem is it's also affected by weather. So if you have a huge storm, then right after the, fer the fertilizer is applied, if there's a huge storm, all that before the plant can take it, all that fertilizer is going to end up in the river. Uh, if you have a dry spell, there's lots of time for that fertilizer to be taken up by the plant. So weather can make a huge difference, and that's not in the control of farmers. So, the, so you, if you talk to them, they'll tell you, you know, I do the same thing, but it's not my pro fault that it ends up, you know, the rain came, and what could I do? So, so you know, how do you sort of separate out the weather-related weather problem and the human problem, and, you know, attribute it as an issue? Um, the other uh, challenge in regulating and uh, non-point pollution is you could say, well, you know, yeah, we cannot observe the pollution after it's been generated, but we can find out how much fertilizer was applied, and maybe we can penalize farmers based on their fertilizer application. But um, the problem is that the relationship is not, you know, between fertilizer application and pollution is not one is to one. And it, there's lots of intervening factors. You know, location is one of them. If you're very far from the river, you know, your contribution to pollution might be very small compared to that of a farmer located next to the river. Um, how you apply a fertilizer, when you apply a fertilizer, all of that makes a difference. You know, which variety did you plant? Did it need that much fertilizer? Which crop did you plant? All that makes a difference. And so, um, you know, and how much was there already in the ground? That's sort of the most important thing. If you already have a very fertile and what type of soil you have, 
you know, can it retain the fertilizer? So there's just so many factors that make this a very site-specific problem. This is not a uniform problem that has a uniform solution. It is a site-specific a problem for each, uh, not even a field, even within a field, it can be quite different in terms of what the effect of fertilizer application might be on the environment. Um, it's also a problem where there's asymmetric information. So, uh, you know, the regulators don't know what the farmers are doing and what are the consequences for the farmers if they ask them to do something different. Only the farmer knows what happens if they were to reduce their fertilizer by 10 percent. What is the cost to them? And so, um, so you know, uh, any solutions a regulator may propose are likely to be costly. Farmers will say, oh, yeah, you know, this is going to be, it's going to reduce my profits. I cannot do it. And there's no way for the regulator to know otherwise. Um, in most countries, you know, farmers are not penalized for their pollution. They are, uh, and that's true, I think, even here, definitely in all the developed countries, farmers are not pe penalized. You cannot tell them that you're polluting and therefore have to pay for it. Instead, they have the pay the polluter principle. So we feel, you know, it's farmers feel have the right to do what they want with their land and to make the most returns out of it. And if you ask them to do anything that's going to be costly, then you have to pay, pay them to do something different. So, uh, you know, so in all of these countries, we have programs, cost share programs for, to ask them to reduce nitrogen use, you know, uh, or cost share programs to uh, switch to better irrigation practices, things like that. And uh, there's obviously a limit to how much the government can afford to pay farmers and how it's a huge problem and the amount of money the government has is much smaller than the size of the problem. So if you have to pay f farmers to do this, then um, you're obviously not going to solve the problem. So the question is, you know, um, you cannot put, give all farmers payments and then, uh, you know, farmers have a voluntary right to decide whether they want to join such a program. They, they may feel that the payment that the government is giving is too little and they'd rather just do what they want. So it's, so you can't get universal coverage, which means that not every polluter is going to be paid not to pollute and so a large part of the problem remains unsolved. Uh, this is just an example of irrigation methods. The traditional methods of irrigation are, even in the best of cases, use about 60 percent. The efficiency is 60 percent of what the plant takes up compared to what the, uh, is applied. If you do sprinkler irrigation, that's like a pressurized thing. You can, you can sprinkle water slowly and, you know, at particular times when needed and so on. You can increase efficiency to about 80 percent. If you use drip irrigation, it can go up to 90%, okay? But as you have more advanced technology, it's also more expensive. It requires electricity, it requires, um, you know, equipment, and um, obviously you have to deal with, with the costs, okay? But if you can increase the, uh, you know, you can reduce your water use, you can increase yield because you give the plant water when it needs it. You're not over-stressing it and over-watering it and all of that, um, uh, and it, you can also apply fertilizer, fertigation. You can apply fertil fertilizer as and when needed and so on um, to improve the, the efficiency of your input use. Okay. Uh, precision farming. Precision farming, uh, you know, has been around uh, at least in the U.S. for the last 25, 30 years, and basically what it does is that it's, you can map you, you know, we have now uh, satellite images, we have everything is linked to GPS and you can map every inch of your field to know exactly what is, is the quality of the soil. And then uh, there are, um, you know, yield monitors when you, which are attached to the tractor or the combine. When you're harvesting your field, at every spot it's measuring what yield you got, and it is it is geolocated, so you know at this latitude, this longitude, I picked up this much of yield. And as you go through your field, you know exactly what you got, and you can make a map of it. and And so you know which parts of the field are productive and which parts of the field are not productive. And then 
you can do something about it. Um, there are variable rate applicators. So you, when you go through the field and you're applying nitrogen, you don't have to do it at the same rate. You can put the program, computer program, in the machine and that will change the rate based on the map that you've put into it, which tells you where you need, you know, where the field is productive and where it's not. Uh, with irrigation, you can put timers and you can vary the rate at which irrigation is done in different parts of the field. Uh, you know, you can uh, put in information about that day's temperature and, and whether it's going to rain or not. And, and you can irrigate only when needed and how much is needed based on the soil moisture, based on the precipitation. So there's now very sophisticated ways actually of uh, varying the rate at which you're applying uh, inputs in your field and um, uh, not, not over applying or under applying and so on. So the problem has been that even though this, this technology has, has existed now for 25 years, uh, not more than 30 or 40 percent of the farmers, even in the U.S., use it, or anywhere in the world are, are using it. And in part, the challenge has been that even though we have the technology to do it, we actually lack the knowledge of telling the farmer of how much they could apply. So you have the yield monitor data, you have the map that says you get less yield here and more over there, but you have to tell the farmer, okay, so how much should you apply here and how much should you apply there? And for that, you need knowledge, and we lack that knowledge. We do not know how t what he should do. So we have the equipment, we have the GPS, we have the variable rate technology, but we cannot tell the farmer how he should change his application rate in response to what he's seeing on those maps and so on. So, so, so that's been the problem for the last 30 years. Uh, now we've, we are finding a new solution for that, and, and you know that solution is called big data. So I don't know if you've heard of this new revolution, which is that uh, you have companies like you know these big major uh, companies like Monsanto and you know Dupont and Pioneer and um, and others, and what they are doing is that they are realizing that you know a farmer cannot figure this out for himself. What should I do when I see these differences? And so they are taking data from millions of farmers, or you know thousands and hundreds of thousands of farmers, and using sophisticated computer algorithms and and machine learning technology techniques to figure out how you should respond to this variability. What is the relationship between what you're observing and what your response to it should be, okay? So this is this big data revolution that's happening uh, combined with the fact that we have got all these mobile technologies, you know, our smartphones. We have got um, um, uh, the ability to gather and put layers of data together. We can store all this data in the cloud. We can do things with it that were not possible before because we have got improved information technology and we can communicate. You know, a remote uh, device can tell the farmer, okay, it's going to rain, it's going to be this, this is your field, I already know what your field is like, do this now. And it gives the farmer that information in his hand and he can say, I'm going to remotely turn on the irrigation equipment and, and it'll get irrigated. So. Uh, and that's not just in the developed countries. I mean, every farmer in India now probably has a cell phone. And with that cell phone, they can do pretty much the same things you know, to a large extent. They can make those decisions in a much better way than before. So, so that's sort of the way that things are, you know, changing uh, going forward. Okay, so I notice I've been talking now for over an hour. <laughs> um, so, um, um, all right. So, Anyway, so this is, let me just take, you know, a few more minutes and, and, um, and then we can come back to this. So this is sort of an example of what you can, what is, you know, a remote sensing can give you. It can tell you that, you know, which areas of your field are more profitable and which ones are less profitable. The ones which are in red are the areas where you're making negative profits. And the areas in yellow, and as it gets darker, are the ones where you're making higher profits. So it, you can tell the farmer, these are the productive areas and these are not. Uh, the areas which are not productive are also the areas, this tells you how much of nitrate leaching is happening from this field. You can actually measure it if you put the equipment there. These are also the areas where you have the largest nitrate leaching happening. So actually, you if you don't 
you should probably not put any crops here because you're losing money and causing an environmental problem. So if you have this information side by side, then you can tell farmers not to grow their crops in some areas and grow them in others. And so this is a whole you know, other field. You can see the variability within the field. Areas which are red are the ones where you make negative profits. Areas that are green, you make positive profits. And so some areas you should probably are better off not being planted. You should just leave the land idle because, and save the inputs, not plant anything there because you're not going to make money out of it. Um, and other areas you can do better at it. So if you have that kind of information, then you can start dealing with this problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. This is just the monetary financial profit. If you factor in the environmental profit, then maybe some of the other areas may also not be worth growing on. But this is just, you know, from the farmer's uh, perspective, it's not worth growing anything over there. Yeah. All right. So that sort of basically was my way of telling you about uh, the some of the, you know, an environmental problem related to agriculture and that you can observe and see around you what might be an interesting research problem here. Uh, you know, in India, there's still a lot more agriculture and land under agriculture. And, and so then we can talk about what, how you can model it. And so now, once you observe this problem, what can you do to look at what are the private incentives, what are the you know, uh, social incentives, and what might be some policy solutions to it, and, and technological solutions to it, and so on. So we'll stop here. Uh, we'll take a little bit of a break. And then uh, where are we going to meet after this? So I'm wondering if you have groups here. Yeah, I mean, you can. Um, the OK, so let's accumulate. Yeah, let's accumulate outside, if, in, you know, and yeah, then let's, in the meantime, place. yeah. And then in the meantime, we'll figure out a place where we can meet up. Or um, if you are, you know, most of you want to do individually, then of course, this is perfectly fine. You, you know, take 15, 20 minutes or think a little bit about some problem that you've, you're familiar with and that we can go from there.